Well, thanks for the tunes, Dave, but I think that we should probably start the meeting because I saw 14 and I haven't seen that number go up. Um, I am Deb Henton, the Executive Director of MASA, as many of you know, and I welcome you to this session about contracted busing. I thank Dave for being our communications person to put out the information about this session and for being our technical assistance today. And for Jenna, for her willingness to share with you um, some information about contracted busing. I have to hop in my car to drive to Owatonna um, to visit the new high school there. So I can't stay with you for the session, but I do wanna share with you my personal experience when I was a superintendent, we went to contracted busing. And after we did that, my board chair said, Deb, I will talk to anybody about what a great move it was for us. So I hope you find this session valuable. And again, thank you, Dave. And thank you very much, Jenna, for providing the information and to all of you for attending. All right, thank you so much, Deb, for that wonderful introduction. I am so happy to get to be here today and talk with all of you. I'm going to be flipping back and forth between the presentation and between my face talking to you because I think it's nicer to interact with people than a uh, screen the entire time. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, please do not be afraid to hop in and ask it. I really want this to be what you need today and what you're looking for to answer your questions. So the presentation I have is a baseline and my aim is to really be helpful to you. I'm gonna share my screen here to start off. All right, there we go. Can you see what's going on there? Wonderful. So that's me. A sincere welcome to you. I am so happy to be here today with you. And there's nothing like a little humor to start things off with. Everyone is in awe of the lion tamer in a cage with half a dozen lions. Everyone but a school bus driver. Uh, I know this is true. I actually started driving bus when I was 18. Yes, that is legal. It was my senior year in high school. I turned 18 in September of that year. And dad said, you're going to do it. And the way that that worked in my house was okay. <laughs> so I did. I have three intentions today to talk about with you. The first is to clarify the responsibility of transportation contractors. The second is to promote best practices for communication with transportation contractors. There's a lot of moving pieces and like anything for it to run smoothly, communication is key. I'll speak a little to technology and how that can aid in the process as well. And then I believe most importantly for this group, help you develop expectations for potential contractors. Does that sound good to you? All right, away we go. So Minnesota school districts and contractors, a great partnership. In case you are interested, about 40% of the school districts in Minnesota are district run transportation systems while contractors make up about 60% of the operations that happen. In recent years, I have seen more and more convert to contracted transportation. And I will talk about why that is in just a little bit. I am guessing if you're on this call, you could probably state some reasons to me why you might wanna get this off your plate. Where the genesis of this presentation came from was about six years ago. I was in a class with business leaders and this gentleman, Marcus Sheridan, came in and he had written a book called They Ask, You Answer, this radical new approach to marketing. And it is tell customers the truth. Gee, imagine that. And right away, like anyone, I thought, well, my industry is unique. It doesn't, it doesn't apply to us. This doesn't work. And the more I thought about it, the more I really questioned my assumptions and thought, no, I think that we need to sort of pull back the blanket on this and be completely open with our districts and say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's happening. Here's what we're doing. 
just to promote that understanding. So dealing with the first part, we have equipment. And with equipment, helping you understand that role if you're running your own, um, we have the annual DOT inspections. If you're running your own uh, transportation, does this cause any of you heartburn when these inspections come around and, and it's that time of year? It can be a hectic time. It's part of what your contractor would take care of. Having a maintenance program, uh, we have a, a maintenance program where we do uh, checks, mid-services, full services. We like to do all of our own mechanical in-house. It's part of our model. There's how do you handle breakdowns? What do you do when a bus breaks down? Do you send out a rescue bus? Uh, do you have someone local? Maybe you're friends with a local district or contractor and they can send somebody out if you're on the road on a field trip and handle that. Body work, oftentimes with the salt on our roads and the chemicals, the engine will continue on and on, but the body looks, looks pretty bad after a while and becomes a safety concern. So being able to accomplish body work in a way that makes sense. Type three equipment, the vans. Um, personally, I thought one really good piece of legislation, I'm kind of an optimist that came through, is type three vehicles now can continue on beyond that 12 year limit. That has been true with buses, as long as it passes inspection, it can continue on. That is now true of our type three vehicles. So that was, that was a little bright spot in legislation this year. And then purchasing, considering how are you gonna purchase? Are you gonna purchase diesel, gas, propane? Are you gonna put your foot into electric? What company do you feel like has the best product? Are you able to time your purchases? where you're over, you're turning over your fleet every so many years. Questions on equipment. Okie dokie. Then we have staffing. Uh, oftentimes with the location, you'll want a manager, mechanic to do the fleet, dispatch person, handling all the comings and goings for the radio, obviously your CDL drivers, type three drivers, and then Paris for the buses. All right, so that was a little bit of an overview of what, um, we, what we provide for districts. Best practices in communication, here are all those areas that you really have to have great communication uh, with your contracted service. Snow days, what's going on? We have superintendents, some of them will take a north end and then we have our folks out on the south end. Roads can look different at different places in a district. Many cover a lot of ground. So you wanna have great communication. I will tell you most likely if your provider is telling you it's not safe to go, it really is because it's not safe to go. We prefer to go to school, just so you're aware. Our contract is usually based off so many days. So if it's able to run, yeah, we would prefer to run. Discipline issues, you have to have that down pat. How does it work with the driver on the bus as well as the school? What's the communication? Is it set up in an online form? Is there a way to submit forms when there's discipline issues? And then back to the driver, how do they know if there was a consequence or what happened? And that connected piece is really key. I think it's really key in letting drivers know that when they do a write-up, that there is some sort of something that happens on the other end. Extracurricular schedules. This is a piece where we like to bring in technology. We have a program called Trip Finder. We do it in almost all of our districts and anybody that needs the extracurricular or field trip or whatever, they just submit it, we have it, everything's recorded. I love Br Brene Brown's comment that clear is kind. And I think that that system just allows there to be complete clarity about what's needed and what's being filled. Field trips, coordinating field trips. If we have everybody gone during route time, that is not good. It brings into issues with 
drivers as well as amount of equipment. So if you're able to stagger field trips and make sure that they're not leaving or arriving during route time, especially during the spring of the year, can be really helpful. Bell times in larger districts, sometimes allowing bell times can um, help us to be more efficient, to work together to figure out how we might do this, how to get from school to school. Routing, once again, we use a lot of technology and routing. Uh, let me tell you, sometimes I've seen in the past where districts have been concerned about um, contractors overcharging them. Here's the reality. There are not enough drivers. So even if people wanted to just add on routes, it is impossible, right? So it's just not a factor. People truly are trying to be as efficient as they possibly can. And then that piece that the drivers really are part of the, the team, bringing them in, students start and end their day with their bus driver. I really think it's important to have like a little thing that says like meet your bus driver at the front of the bus so they know who that person is, right? So it's an actual human being, not just Mr. Bus Driver. And that can help build that relationship with the kids on the bus. All right, and I, I had a little thing with uh, Princeton and the partnership that we've had there and the communication we have there. I so appreciate it. It's a wonderful relationship. They are absolutely fantastic to work with. And I had them chatting a little bit about it, their experience with us one day, but I'm not gonna show that right now. Getting into contracts. Um, I wanna talk to you just a little bit and I'm actually gonna pop back on. So I can speak to you a little bit because I prefer that. Let's see. Okay, there we go. What I would like to talk to you about with contracts is many times people look only at the daily route rate. There are many other pieces to contract or contracts than just that piece. In contracts, you can have some I've seen where they really specify that the age of fleet needs to be X amount of years, nothing older than this amount. Uh, storage of buses, do you require that the buses be under roof or can they be parked out just in the elements? Some people in some districts we have where it's by student as opposed to by route or how it's charged. So you can see some different comparisons with that. I would recommend going by route just because you'll have an easier comp to most districts. There are precious few that go by student and it can make it harder to really compare what's going on. A fuel clause in some places you will have the district completely pay for the fuel, it's not even on the table, and they purchase it, and then the contractor uses the fuel to, you know, fuel everything, but the charge is independent of that. From there, there are, like, maybe very low fuel clause where the, the contractor pays the first dollar twenty-five, and oftentimes these are long-time relationships where back when fuel was that price, that's what it was, and then the district pays 100% over that. There's also some where, say it said it may be like uh, $3, but then the district and the contractor split the cost over the $3, so you both have skin in the game. What you need to realize is the that daily route rate is directly influenced by the fuel clause. So it, it depends if you want to be in the fuel market a little bit and get the benefit when it's low and get the, the pop when it's high or the, you know, kind of the kick in the pants when it's high, you can do that or you can have it be a shared thing with the contractor. Regular routes versus special education. Oftentimes over the past, and I'm not sure exactly where it's at now, but there are more subsidies for special education. So sometimes folks like to write a contract with a lot of the money put in special education. You can do that to some extent, and I don't believe overall that it's a great practice, just because 
it's not where it's supposed to be, right? You can, you can a little bit, but you want to be very careful about that with, with having uh, integrity in what you're doing. Extracurricular, oftentimes new buses go on extracurricular. I will tell you that contractors don't necessarily make that much money off the extracurricular piece. It's something they provide, they're happy to do. They want to have their new shiny buses in there. Um, but more of the daily route rate, that's where they need things built into. And then the, the duration of the contract can, can hamper. Um, when a contractor comes in, oftentimes they have a very heavy investment in the fleet. Maybe they need to put up facilities. There's lots of pieces to that. And banks like to see at least four years. If you don't have that, they're not sure, uh, the bank isn't sure on their return of investment and that can make it really difficult. So you can do contracts in which we say, okay, we're going to do so many years and we're not gonna figure out rates for all those years yet, right? So let's leave the, the tailing two years open because we're not sure. I mean, this last year and the year before that were great indicators of what can happen that just throws everybody for a loop. All right. And I'm going to share my screen again for the next piece. There we go. All right, reasons districts hire contractors. I would love to actually hear from you. If you're attending this, I'm really curious, why, why are you attending today? What are you interested in? What, what reasons might you want to hire a contractor? See, I was a teacher, so I was a high school teacher, so you get this part of me now where I wanna engage with you and find out. Hi, Bill Grant at St. Peter's Schools. Um, I'm here because we are preparing to um, put up for a uh, RFP for contracted yes. services and just wanted to learn more about the pieces that should be included in that. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate you having your screen on and talking to me. Gene, I also feel the same way. I wanted to learn a little bit more about contracting. I know you work out of uh, uh, Barrett. Yes. You know, so I go by there many times, but, you know, I look at the shortage of bus drivers, kind of watching that very closely. And uh, maybe there are things we can do here from extracurricular itself, but then sometimes the bus routes are kind of a big deal because we need mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have subs many times. I drive a bus route once in a while. But I'm saying it's uh, it's going to be a critical issue as time moves on for licensed bus drivers. Agree. Thank you. I just needed to learn a little bit more about it. Absolutely. And um, if you guys would like, I can talk a little bit more. Uh, I do have the training, the ELDT piece at, on this slide. And I can, if that's something people would like to hear more about, I can speak more to that as well. I am a little bit curious about that. You know, we work through the Northwest Service Co-op right now, and they charge, depending upon the number of people they have there, because it's quite a lengthy training. You know, we pay participant costs. It might be $30 one time, it might be $60 a one, and if there's only three people, it might be $200. Mm -hmm. That has been an issue for some new drivers coming in here which we have paid for mm -hmm. but i think i don't know why the licensing has become such a crazy thing because we never had it before mm -hmm. but yes randy i hear you <laughs> uh what we've done internally i had mentioned i was a teacher we've actually developed our own curriculum and in order to help bring in drivers, 
you will often see companies putting up like $1,000 signing bonus, $2,000, $5,000. Well, the quickest way to tick off your current drivers, I believe, is to give somebody brand new a chunk of change like that. So I have I have been heard to say, and I hope I never need to eat my size nine, but I've been heard to say that we will never do that. Um, and I may have to eat my shoe someday for that. What we do instead is we have our own training program. It's well laid out. I've planned the curriculum. I've done all those things. And then we we hire people and then they need to come in on site, but we pay them to do their training, right? So we pay them as they're studying, as they're going through the flashcards, as they're completing the workbook and then going and taking their tests and then behind the wheel. So we have pulled that in house and have made it so our our seasoned drivers aren't offended because, okay, they're in here working, they're learning, they're getting paid for that. I don't have a problem with that. And then it enables us not to lose somebody to Casey's or Quick Trip that they can go there and start getting paid immediately. So those are some pieces that we have done and implemented that we found helpful with our staffing. Anything else people have? I can see Chris and David, Ryan, hello. Hi, Jenna. A uh, uh, lot of questions because I, third year superintendent, gone through a lot of this process and in fact, uh, continuing it. Um, I'd like to hear from you what you're seeing from across the state because I know Palmer has got uh, services in quite a few districts. Um, I'd like to I'd like to hear what some of the trends are with uh, with rates right now, because uh, I think we're paying one of the highest in the state of Minnesota right now. We're paying $400 a day per route. Um, so I'd like to see some of that. I'd like to, some of that data, what's what's kind of the trend right now. Um, I actually have a lot of questions, but I think that's a sidebar conversation with you, you and I on a separate note. What I can tell you, I, I'm glad you brought it up, Ryan, ever, you know, sometimes there's an elephant in the room and I appreciate being able to tell you what's going on with rates. What I can tell you is in this last year, we've been partners with districts in some places, we're almost in our 50th year. Through the years, we've had times where often we're just mirrored, right? Your district gets 2%, we get 2%. There have been times when districts got zero, we've actually gone along with them and gotten zero, right? What has happened in the last couple of years with inflation has, I came in in certain districts where we really needed a market co correction and was asking and honestly ended up receiving because sincerely we needed a double digit increase with driver wages, with the legislation on unemployment, with the sake and sick time, with all these pieces and inflation being. So if inflation was 9% the previous year and we ended up with a 2%, do you know what I mean? Because that's what our contract was. And then you compound that on another year of like 7% and our contract, you know, we get another 2% or maybe three, when we're coming into negotiating, then we ended up asking for, for more. I would ask that your contractor lay out the reason why. And that's what we did. We, we had all of our costs and what had gone up and the percentages that those had gone up in order to tell the story. So that that has been the reality. I don't like coming to school districts and, and doing that. And if we want to continue to exist in order to train drivers, in order to be staffed, in order to do all these things, I can speak to that, that that has been a reality. I'm not sure if that's helpful to you, Ryan. I hope it is. Yeah, it is. I appreciate that, Jenna. I think uh, my district is a, just in a unique situation because I don't have, uh, I don't have contractors around. My, it's very slim pickings, so... Um, and Mr. Brewer can uh, can say the same. We're we're neighboring districts, so it's uh, it's it's difficult. And I apologize. Where are you located? Uh, Northwest Minnesota, Clearbrook, Gonvik. 
Yeah. If you would like to know my, do you mind if I talk to you about what I think could be effective in an area like yours? I think you would want um, two or three districts to get together and with that, put out a joint RFP because even for someone like us, like we'd love to help you, right? But a onesie twosie can be really difficult. If we can have a little bit of a hub in an area, it can make sense. We can provide the support because if we come in and do what you're doing now, we'll have a lot of the same results. But if we're able to do our model where like for us, core value number four, we're a business family and we help each other, we can deploy our, our resources there. We can work together. Can we have a mechanic that serves the different ones? Um, how can we pull that to truly be successful? And then with that as well, I mean, we have two recruiters on staff. We deploy them to the community. we would I'm not trying to sell you on this. I'm just telling you that that's how it could be successful. And, and have a good return for you guys in your communities, as well as making it more affordable. Because even to have like five routes in a location, those routes will cost more oftentimes because you still have to have so much staff just to support that operation. No, it makes total sense. In fact, uh, uh, my transportation consultant who I work with, you work with a lot um, yourself on your contracts and has had conversations with you. So um, he's reiterated that same concept. So I, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth. It might not be what you hear, but that's, that's the reality. Anything else? Let's see. Um, I'm the director of transportation with contractors. We have historically always used one and recently had the need to use two. I'm curious as to what is happening in other districts. We have seen a lot of different things. I would say in some places we're the only contractor in other places. Um, there are two or in St. Cloud, there's, there's multiple contractors and we're one of many there. I believe that it, can be a little more complicated and then you bring to need to bring people more people to the table and promote a great relationship but we have great relationships with our fellow contractors and help each other to make sure that we can get the job done and that your service is smooth because at the end of the day we're providing the service to the district okay all right I am going to share my screen and flash up the, I believe it's my last one. Um, Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, this is not my last one. This is a little bit more personal. I live in Pine City, Minnesota, and my boys have all played um, for the Pine City Dragons. And we have a coach there. He's he's well known. I do believe he does a great job with the young young men on his team and help you develop expectations for school transportation services. What I bring this to is on on this coach's team, everybody has their role, right? And he celebrates what each role is. Uh, I had a son that his job was really to do rebounds and assists. And you know what? On defense, really completely frustrate uh, their, their lead scorer. That's a fantastic role. Very proud of it. And it's clearly communicated and everyone knows what they need to do. I see that really as a a metaphor for what happens with uh, school transportation services and what it looks like when people are really able to concentrate on the role that they play and then for superintendents being freed up to run a school, right? Because <laughs> that's what you really need to do. Okay, and this is the big one, things to consider when hiring a contractor. 
So I'm going to pop back off of this and talk to you directly. I think this is a key, a key piece. And I know we have about a half hour left and I am glad we do because I think this is a, a key part of the conversation. Other questions I'm happy to answer as well. Okay. Uh, the biggest thing, if you are considering contracted transportation, or even if you're at the place where you're looking at an RFP, I really recommend talk to your colleagues, which I know you guys all do, right? I know, especially on snow days, I had a uh, not Todd Lee, but Tom Lee, who was in Wasika with us, he's like, we're all lemmings, you know? So it's like, okay, what are we doing today? And then we all try to figure out, are, are you canceling school or not? Um, but talk with other superintendents and districts where that contractor is serving. You'll get the story as to what is their experience? What are they like to work with? Um, Ryan, right? What what is it that happens when you come into negotiations? Are what does that look like? So I I strongly recommend that. I would also say check out their inspection record with the DOT. Do they run safe equipment? Right? Kids ride those buses. How are they doing with that? I would say find out about their training program. You know, if you're having trouble finding drivers, it's not like they have a magic wand. So what are they doing? How are they bringing in drivers? What training do they have? What ongoing training? Because safety of kids is, it's the most important thing. Make sure that you are hiring a contractor that really does take that seriously. And I would say doesn't just give it lip service, like ask specific questions about it. Find out how they're going to fill those needed positions. I'd look carefully at the proposals. I had alluded this to this before. Um, I once went into a negotiation and I was shown, um, rates that were considerably lower than, than ours and asked if we would, we would do that. And I just, by the way, I said, well, what is the fuel clause in that, in that district? Well, it turned out that the school district in that district paid entirely for the fuel. So, I was like, no, I, I want that deal. You guys give me that rate and pay for the fuel, like rock on. So it was just sort of a kind of a funny moment in a way, but also very striking to me, the things that I really noticed, but maybe aren't on the top of radar um, for folks in schools, because that, that makes a big difference in what the rate is. I would say if you're looking at going out there, sometimes people like to dangle a shiny object. And if someone is like promising you an entire brand new fleet of buses, I would be more concerned and curious about that. What would the fleet look like in how many years? And if this person is growing, are they gonna take those buses out and put them somewhere else? And then, you know, after they've been here a few years and leave us with something else. Maybe not, but it, it would be something that I would be curious about. Are they a reputable company with a long history? You're dealing with people that are going to be hauling the kids in your district. And if you do run your own transportation, I've, I've heard very often food service and transportation, right, can be the bane of your existence. Um, by outsourcing this, you want to get it off your plate and you want someone that's going to take it off your plate and not <laughs> have it still be there. And now you just got another headache and you're paying more for it. And then the question, um, this is this is part of my my own heart. Are they a national chain after the deal is done? Will they even care about you and will you be stuck with them? Here is part of um, the Marcus Sheridan piece where it's they ask, you answer. Here's the reality. If you're looking at contracting out your transportation, that is your opportunity 
to truly um, get folks in and look at them and see what it is. Once you have contracted your transportation with a provider, and they are there and they are invested, it will be very difficult to get another reputable provider to come in and bid them out. Um, there's sort of, they call it a gentleman's understanding in our industry, but you know, I, obviously I'm not. <laughs> um, but that understanding that many people have their livelihoods invested there and to come in and do a low bid and, and boot them out is, is frowned upon. Once again, I'm I'm just telling you very clearly how how this works. If you have somebody that is truly being unreasonable and it is not, you are not able to continue the relationship, you can discontinue with them. And then like they are they are out of the picture. Then you will have other people come in. So if it is bad and you're like, this is not working for me, then you got to be able to like, yep, they, they are out. This is unsupportable. It is not good. And get rid of them and then other people will come in. In questions on that, I welcome them. Um, like I said, I, I just want to tell you the truth about how this works. So that's where I say, really be careful when you make your choice. There are wonderful contractors out there. There are wonderful people that dedicate their lives to student transportation. You want to have, you want to have one of those who's going to truly be a partner and work with you through the ups and downs and through the years and figure out how they can support you in getting your kids to school, right? Other questions that you have, things that I can help with. Angry comments about something I've said. <laughs> so if you have contracted services, but you feel it's your duty to go out for an RFP, how do you go about that? You can still publish your RFP and send it out, right? You, I am not sure as to the responses you will, you will get, but you can certainly publish it and send it out. Yes. You can reach out to individual contractors. Like if you are really interested and really looking, um, I do know that my first question would be, are you happy with the service you're receiving? Do you have a good relationship with your current contractor? And if you tell me yes to those questions, I will tell you, like, bless you, that is wonderful. Good. Good question. And feel free to speak. I'm kind of, you can tell I'm kind of a chatty girl. I like to have the interaction. So I, I probably look funny because I'm all leaned into my computer trying to connect. Does anybody have issues with contractors not fulfilling their contract completely and where to go from there? I just want to make sure if that, that has been a thing. I understand the portion of like the driver shortage, um, but then what happens if a contractor actually has other districts that they provide for, but they aren't currently fulfilling your contract? Great question, Naisha. I will, I am opening to the group. Yeah. What have you guys seen? I, okay, I can speak to a little bit of our experience with this. Um, we just, it, uh, Palmer, we do everything we can 
within our power to make sure that we're fully staffed and that kids get to school. I have heard, particularly in the metro area, that there, there have been instances of this, uh, routes are left open, things are you know, not taken care of. We will, like we're a business family, we help each other. We'll have drivers come from different locations to help out. We've had a lot of our had our IT director driving bus, you know, you pull different people. It's not a good way sustainably to do it. Um, hire recruiters to deal with the problem. I mean, it's our, I take the responsibility seriously that we need to fulfill what we've said we will do. Um, I would say it would really be working with the district to say, hey, can we adjust bell times? Cause then we can make this happen. Um, are we able to do a second loop somewhere? So it would really be looking at if you truly are in that situation and you're that short, how might we come together to, to make this work so kids can get where they need to go? I don't so know. How has any, it answers, uh, you know, a great deal. I just have kind of another question. Has anybody dealt with or have because I understand that even coming from like a contractor perspective in the industry to where you just make it work, you figure it out, everybody goes through. And so I'm not from the contractor side now. And I think there's a difference this year for me um, with the contractor because I've never seen the change in things. And there's a lot of laws that change a lot of things that are pretty much having the contractor, you know, the new law that's coming out that's going to start in January when it comes to time off. And then you have, you know, the the unemployment. So there are a lot of different challenges for contractors. But I do wonder if you're from like the district side or the contractor side, how you're handling situations of not fulfilling the contract completely because as a district, I don't want to be in a position of, okay, we're going to have to do this and go to the extreme because of it. And you know, the industry is small, especially in the metro area. It, it's not that big. It's not that, there's not that many contractors, you know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we are being fulfilled with what we should. We have a primary contractor. That's what I said in the in the chat. We've never had more than one. We've always had just our one primary and this year we had to step in and add an additional one to back up the other one. And that backup is happening while it's our primary contractor runs routes for other districts. Mm -hmm. So it's a little tricky for me because if they did not add on those other things when we're their primary, we would not need to add on another contractor. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering just from a contractor's perspective, how you would deal with situations if you were a contractor and you weren't able to fulfill something, I'm not, I don't think you would go and add on to your plate on another end. You know what I mean? Agreed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I will tell you when we go to, uh, we serve 26 districts throughout the state of Minnesota. And when we do go and have a conversation with somebody that's checking out um, our services, I actually <laughs> am known to bring out that list and say our first allegiance is to these 26. The only way that we can take on yours is if we can continue to provide the service that we do to these 26. And if you do contract to us, you are part of this list and you are our primary, you know, focus, right? If we add somebody else on, they will hear the same thing because these are who our customers are. Yeah, Naisha, I am I'm sorry you're experiencing that. I don't no, know if no. you want to go down the route of, you know, what are the consequences if people aren't fulfilling what they need to fulfill? Of and course. If it is, the one thing that I see, and I, I will speak to this in the metro area, 
Um, it is different where there is more bidding. And mm -hmm. my, my sense of that is part of the reason that we're able to be successful is because we really do form relationships and become part of the community. And it's truly a partnership. I think when people are like, well, I have this fleet of buses, I'm going to go here. And then if they kick me out there, then I can just go here and bid somebody else out. I think at the end of the day, um, the parents and the kids really suffer because it's you're in more of that game as opposed to really receiving that service from a, a party that's really invested in your community, cares about you, and is really working on building that relationship with the community that's long-term. Okay, time for an uncom uncomfortable question. So, Long before I came to the district that I'm in, I understand that a different bus service was here 20 years ago and went to a different bus service. Mm -hmm. And the existing bus service, uh, when they heard that um, they were considering going to another service, uh, lined their buses up down Main Street and packed the boardroom and fought against the decision. Is that typical behavior for bus companies? In your particular situation, I think there was a long history um, between the two parties involved. And I think that- Is that, that typical could, though? I mean, does no, that happen? No. Yeah. No, that would not be typical. Yeah. I wasn't good a part question. of it, so I have no... Yeah, that that is a good thing not to be a part of, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yes. Was that a good enough answer, Bill? And if you want to talk more about it offline, I am more than happy to do that. Other questions, thoughts, comments? All right. I can go on just a little bit here, sharing the screen again. All right. So I hope that today I have honored my intentions, clarifying the responsibilities of transportation contractors promoting best practices of communication, which I believe is so key to a successful relationship and helping you develop your expectations for potential contractors. And I am all about the team and how working together really makes it a successful partnership. I talk about partnership a lot. That's really what it is. There's my info. That is my cell phone number. It will ring right on this. So All right. Anything else that I can help you with? Did you get what you wanted out of this? Good, thanks, Randy. Gina, I think the biggest piece that I take away is, is you know, that forming that trust with that company because we never want to give up our business within the school business. Yeah, that that's the tough part for me. 
Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a transportation business, but then how do you form that trust that you're not being overcharged? I mean, that kind of is a barrier. I've been with both now and I've seen both sides, but it's always negotiable. Mm -hmm. I know there's costs on both ends and that's why I kind of express that piece because that's the, uh, the scary part. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Right. That trust is a big deal. It, it really is. Um, you, you know, it's public information. You can pull contracts from surrounding districts. Um, sometimes there's things like you might have a district where they cover a ton of miles and in that case, it might be more expensive, but it's just because the the mileage being covered is so much greater than in another area that can be more compact. So there's there's multiple pieces, but I think looking into that can be helpful to give you some peace of mind as to what is going around, going on around you. Um, I do like to be a, a trusted source for people. I've even had, you know, soup say, hey, this last year they were asking for an X percentage, especially in the last couple of years to where I think maybe I brought some peace of mind and that, yeah, in the last couple of years, the reality has been that it's the costs have gone up. There was a question in the chat from Bruce that yes, said, uh, from when Bruce. assuming a new contract slash district, what has been your typical path of action with the existing fleet slash drivers in the district? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And thanks for bringing that up, Dave. I appreciate it. What we do is we usually purchase the existing fleet. So we will put in an offer for those assets as part of you know, the deal and we'll say, okay, for all of your buses, we'll have them evaluated by an outside source and then offer that. So maybe the entire fleet is, you know, 1.1 million. And we would purchase that usually over like a five-year term or something with maybe 5% interest, something like that. And that can especially offset the costs in the, in the first couple of years. As far as the driver's your drivers, we would really want as our drivers, right? The drivers in St. Clair, Minnesota are the St. Clair, Minnesota drivers, right? And at the end of the day, bus drivers drive for kids. They drive because they love kids, right? And whether it's for the school district or for a, an, a company that's care, taking care of things, that tends to be... Um, they're promotional and, and it's important to get them onboarded, really make them feel welcome and part of the team. Yeah, great question, Bruce. Thank you. I know you guys are very busy. I really appreciate you taking the time to learn about this and, and spend this time with me. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you to uh, Jennifer hosting this session today uh, with for our members and our colleagues from our other uh, educational organizations. Uh, I'll be sure to send out the link to the slides and then uh, a copy of the recording to uh, everyone who attended and registered. So that'll uh, come through your email shortly. Thank you. All right. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.